Hello and welcome to the Candlelight Podcast, where I, Muhammad Abdullah, talk about different topics, including some of my favorites, which are movies, martial arts, and philosophy. Let's start with this week's quote. Most men lead lives of silent desperation. This quote was brought to us by uh, the philosopher uh, Henry David Thoreau. And I've uh, heard it this week, actually, on the Joe Rogan's podcast uh, with Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle was, uh, um, came by as a guest, and uh, they actually, uh, at one point in the podcast, uh, Joe brought up this quote uh, in order to signify you know, something that they were talking about, which was how some people don't, um, don't put their all into their dreams. Some, like most people, most men lead lives of silent desperation. Most men, most people, they do not, you know, kind of uh, lay out a goal, lay out a dream where they want to follow, where they want to, uh, you know, just pursue. They kind of feel, you know, uh, they have that attitude every day where, oh, I have to work today as well, and tomorrow I have work, and then I have to do this, and I have to do that. You know, this downbeat attitude that's not conducive, that's just going to cause you to have, you know, problems every day because your attitude is the problem it's not necessarily your life change your attitude and you kind of change your life in that matter so instead of seeing like every day as uh, something you know you got tasks to do or you have um you know like a job you have uh, you know chores just look at it as if you have cha- you know challenges that you have to go through it's like it's kind of fun you know just put a, put up a list of what you have to do and then go do it make it fun for yourself uh, reward yourself at the end of the day. Have a cup of chocolate milk or something. Oh, something I kind of like to do. Uh, on the days that I have, you know, extremely, like, just, you know, amazing through the roof productivity, I like to reward myself at the end of the day by going to, you know, a cafeteria outside my, uh, near my house uh, where I just get, you know, a cup of Horlicks. You know, this uh, drink called the Hor- Horlicks. You mix it with milk, you put in some sugar, and it just tastes awesome. It's kind of like chocolate milk, but it's a bit different. Tastes very good. I enjoy it. It's a really good, um, you know, chill drink at the end as a reward at the end of the day after a long day of work. So that's what I like to do. And uh, this quote, um, back to this quote, we shouldn't li- live our lives like that. You know, most people do, but... We really shouldn't. We should have a positive outlook on life, on life, and have a dream. Have, have a you know long term dream, where you have goals in the short term that help you achieve that long term dream, that long term um, objective. So, in order to you know avoid a life of uh, being miserable and uh, you know kind of maybe even resent resentful because you did not achieve what you wanted to achieve in life, you didn't uh, you know follow your passion. And by the way, a lot of people actually kind of. Uh, you know, I've seen kind of don't really necessarily have one, uh, you know, have a certain passion. They just kind of like, like, they don't even know what to do with their lives. I'd say, you know, what worked for me, because I was in that situation, I kind of am still in that spot, but I am getting better, because I am on the other side of, you know, uh, my college career, and I'm about to graduate soon. Uh, I do, I do advise to kind of try your hand at a lot of things. If you like, like anything, just try it out. If you like uh, cooking, try out cooking. If you even like, you know, reading, try out reading. If you like painting, try out painting. If you like mathematics, do that. You know, uh, architecture, do that. You know, just like dabble into all these different things. Uh, Enroll in a few courses, you know, courses that are a few weeks or that are not that long. You know, get some experience where in fields that you might have a proclivity to, something that you might see yourself working in in the future, and just, you know, Make uh, make up your passion based on that. Keep in mind, guys, you don't, uh, like, a, like a quote I said, you know, a weeks ago, you don't necessarily have to find yourself. You can also define yourself. So don't stick to, it's like, it's just not me. I don't feel like this is me. We weren't born out of our mother's wombs, and, you know, a certain person. We had to build up that character, you know, our character, who we are, our personality throughout life. S- sure, we do have a genetic makeup and a temperament. Some people are more agreeable. Some people uh, people are more uh, extroverted. Some people are more, you know, we do have temperaments. True. However, we do have a good portion of our lives that we create ourselves. It's, not, it's like leveling, leveling up in a video game as a character, which is pretty cool. 
Oh, speaking of video games, uh, I, uh, I, I played uh, Dishonored. You know the video game Dishonored. Uh, oh, uh, like, and I finished just yesterday. Oh, no, it wasn't yesterday. It was uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, you know, just kind of went through that old game again, uh, a game back from 2012. It was an awesome game. Uh, I played it on the PS3 when it first came out. Then I played the second game on the PS4. And then I got the game again, the first one, on the PC, on my computer. And I played it. And I, I think playing it on the computer is maybe more enjoyable than playing it on the PlayStation. But uh, I'm plan- I played it. This game, let me just give you context for what I'm, get, what, what, what I'm about to say. Get, let me give you a preface. This game, you can play it in two ways. Either you go on and just, you know, it's a game about taking revenge on those people who killed someone you love. And uh, you can go about the game in two ways. One way is to, you know, kill everyone. And the other way is to go in a more peaceful route and uh, neutralize them, but don't kill them. And that is the, well, the former, which is killing everyone, is the, is the way I played... Uh, you know, I, I finished it just recently. I played it just recently. And the reason I did that because I just wanted to go through the game again and just enjoy, have fun, and finish it quickly. But in order to play the more peaceful route, you have to take a lo- longer time of playing because you're going to have to like figure out, uh, you know, more less violent way to approach situations in the game. And that's what I'm hopefully going to do. Actually, I'm going to replay the game again uh, doing that. Uh, but not right now because I'm super busy in these next two weeks. I've got finals and exams and projects coming up. I'm going to do it after. Uh, speaking of which, I do have uh, a bunch of summer plans, you know, after like finishing the semester. But I'm going to get into those later because I just want to mention something real quick that I did recently as well that I really had a fun time with. I had, uh, you know, we... We Muslims uh, just went through Eid, Eid al-Fitr, you know, the Eid right after Ramadan ends, where we get to enjoy ourselves, gather with lo- loved ones, and just have meals, and just, you know, really uh, celebrate what we have accomplished in the past month of Ramadan. And I really had an enjo- enjoyable Eid. You know, the UAE government actually, you know, issued the police, uh, Abu Dhabi police and Dubai police, they issued uh, several, you know, statements saying that, look, guys, do not gather. We know it's Eid. We know it's like a time for family gathering, but do not gather, guys. Stop gathering because of COVID, obviously. We don't want the cases to spike. And if you do gather, we're going to issue, you know, fines. And so what we said, obviously, is, nah, nah, we're, we're going to have to gather. We're going to have to get the family back together, you know. So we that's what we did. We gathered and then, uh, yeah, we just uh, had a fun time, me and the family, uh, it was Thursday and Friday. Enjoyed. I managed to finish the video game actually before uh, Friday, before Thursday, right? like on the morning of Thursday before gathering with the family. Uh, so uh, that was actually fun. And hopefully I'm going to play the game again, as I said, in the summer. And I've got a bunch of summer plans that I hope to, you know, hope to go through. Uh, so first off, you know, whether or not I'm traveling this summer, it really depends on the COVID situation. Uh, and on the countries that I want to go to. Um, so I want to I want to travel to Qatar, you know, the country of Qatar, which is a neighbor country of the UAE, a sister country, if one might say, you know, because it's in the, in the GCC. And I've got family there. I've got family uh, that is from Qatar, that live in Qatar. And uh, why do I say Qatar? As if, you know, it's like uh, the Fusha way saying, standard Arabic way of saying. We, I'm supposed, it's like, why am I speaking in Fusha? In standard Arabic, I should, I should just be saying Qatar, you know, the way we say it, Qatar. So I'm going to Qatar, hopefully, if and only if, you know, they loosen the quarantine time period or um, eliminate completely. Because if I go to a Qatar, I have to quarantine for seven days in a hotel before I even see my family. So uh, me and my family have to quarantine before seeing our family there. So uh, if they eliminate that, we'll go. If they don't, well, it's really hard to, you know... Um, Get, just waste seven days in a hotel room isolating from everyone like we're not even gonna be at the same hotel room me and my family here we're gonna be in separate hotel rooms and that's not really uh ideal so we'd rather it uh, be more you know uh if, if oh by the way they do not not have quarantine for people who took the pfizer um vaccination uh, but people who took the sinopharm the chinese one 
they have to uh, quarantine. And seeing as me and my family all take the Chinese one because we live in the UAE and in Sharjah where we took it, uh, they spread out the Sinopharm and in Qatar they spread out the uh, Pfizer. So it's like if you don't have the Pfizer, you got to quarantine. If you do have the Pfizer, you're welcome to come in. And honestly, I didn't really at the time of the vac- uh, you know, uh, vaccine, at the time of vaccinating, I didn't really care which one I took. I just thought, okay, vaccine, vaccine, I'm just going to get the vaccine and, you know, just get it and I'm done with it. Like, that's it. Uh, I didn't make a big fuss about which one I'm going to take. So, and the Sinopharm was the one that was available for me, like uh, convenient to get uh, for me. So that's what I got. And I guess now I have to wait until they loosen the travel restrictions in order to go there, to go to Qatar. But hey, it's all good. I hope that we, we are able to go. Ya Rabb, Allahumma khalna nsir and shufahilna. I hope we go get to see our family. It would be awesome. Another another thing that I do have uh, coming up this summer is hopefully my internship. Uh, I do have to get an internship in order to uh, graduate from university. And that's what I am pl- what I plan to do. Um, get an internship at a company somewhere. And uh, yeah, get like five weeks of training in. Hopefully I'm going to get some, oh, going back to, uh, you know, dabbling and trying and getting some experience to, in order to find where you, um, where you fit in kind of, and also where you want to work in, you know, get that experience in order to uh, educate yourself on what's out there, what's, what's needed in the job market, what can you uh, provide that others can't, which is uh, true for everyone. Every single person on this, on this earth provides something that other people cannot. So every single person is unique and has a talent that is useful to the world. Otherwise, you won't be here. So there is that. I've got my internship as well. And I'm also uh, planning on rereading a book this summer called uh, The Divine Reality. Um, this book is amazing. I Honestly, there was, uh, if there was a top 100 list of the most important books of all time, this would be there. I haven't read every single book, obviously, but I I'm confident in saying it's definitely in the top 100 and most important books of all time because of the importance of this book, the importance uh, of yeah of just showcasing what is truth uh, true in this world and what is not. So I'll read I'll read you the blurb on the back of the cover. I have the book right here. Uh, <laughs> blurb. That's a funny word, but it, that's what it's called. Apparently, the text at the back of the book is called the blurb. But anyway, here it is. So. The Divine Reality, God, Islam, and the Mirage of Atheism. In The Divine Reality, Hamza Andreas Edzortzis provides a compelling case for the rational and spiritual foundations of Islam, whilst intelligently and compassionately deconstructing atheism. Join him on an existential, spiritual, and rational journey that articulates powerful arguments for the existence of God, the Qur'an, the prophethood of Muhammad wasallam, and why we must know, love, and worship God. He addresses academic and popular objections while showing how contemporary atheism is based on false assumptions about reality, which leads to incoherent answers to life's important questions. So... And the certain questions are listed uh, that the book uh, that the book answers, such as does hope, happiness, and human value make sense without the divine? Do we have an ultimate purpose? Can we have consciousness and rational minds without God? Did the universe come from nothing? Does evil and suffering negate divine mercy? Has scientific progress led to the denial of God? Are revelation and prophet- prophethood myths? Is God worthy of our worship. If you want to know the Islamic and uh, intellectual and tra- uh, spiritual tradition to uh, answer these questions, sorry, I'm trying to read this here. Uh, if you want to know the Islamic intellectual and spiritual tradition answers these questions. Ah, I'm, that's the reason I'm having a problem reading this line is because I didn't read the how. If you want to know how the Islamic intellectual and spiritual tradition answers these, these questions, then this is the book for you. So as you can see, it's this is what it is. And uh, speaking of the author, you know, let's read about the author, Hamza Andreas Zortis. <clears throat> His book represents a much needed comprehensive account of Islamic, uh, Islamic theism that draws upon Western and Islamic thought. 
Hamza Andreas Sortis is an international speaker, writer, and instructor. He has a PGCERT and an MA in philosophy and is uh, currently continuing his postgraduate studies in the field. Hamza has studied Islamic thought and theology under qualified scholars. He has delivered workshops and courses on topics related to Islam, thought, Islamic thought, and philosophy. Hamza has debated prominent ac academics and thinkers on Islam and atheism. So as you can see, this book really covers all those bases. And it's funny that, and it's funny that I kind of, uh, <clears throat> it's funny that I mentioned it in this episode, considering that I started uh, the episode with a quote from a naturalist type, naturalist uh, type philosopher, um, the kind who understandably yet uh, mistakenly avoid religion altogether and focus on what sense they can they make they themselves can make of the world, which is both understandable and dangerous. <clears throat> I don't know what's up with my voice today. So uh, the reason for that, the reason uh, it's problematic to make your own meaning in this life. Well, first of all, let's say why it's understandable. Well, you look at the world around you today. If you don't have access to the proper proper information and education, such as you know this book, uh, you would think of your uh, think to yourself like, why am I even uh, listening to whatever other people say? Why don't I just make my own meaning for my own life? You know, I for example want to be a good person. You know, I want to work and you know help other people. I think that's good enough of a meaning for me for myself, and uh, that'd be good. Yes, but the question is, what criteria do you have? to measure good by how do you know that being good is helping others how do you know that that's what good is who said who said that and you'll say uh, one would say rather uh, one would say well it's based on my intuition i feel like this is good therefore i'm gonna do it it's like sure altruistic intentions is some is our intuition as humans however who said that we even have to follow our intuition who said that we should do what we feel is right? Why should we even do what we feel is right? Why? What's the reason? What's the proper objective foundation for that? You know, what's the rational reason for it? And without God, as this book would uh, say, there is no proper rational basis. And therefore, this book argues on many levels for not only the existence of God, but rather why we should accept and love God in the way of the Islamic tradition. And then another question would be as to why the Islamic tradition? And of course, this book r relates as to why the Islamic tradition and not any other type of faith. And guys, it's amazing. Uh, I'd love to do a breakdown of this book, but it'd be awesome for you guys to read it yourself. Perhaps I would do a breakdown later on when I finish the book, you know, just kind of give you the most important points. Even this book is actually condensed. You know, this is thousands of years of research of, you know, uh, theological research in one book and it's only 300 pages it's a good read good understandable simple yet comprehensive and articulate it's amazing i enjoyed it the first time and inshallah i'm gonna enjoy it the second time around as i read it again so uh going back to actually why we can't make our own meaning in this world i like i said it's understandable you see the world around you you don't know uh which uh which which is the correct way up and everybody's t telling you many different things so you just decide to make your own meaning however that could be dangerous because what if someone you know follows that mindset of i'm gonna make my own meaning in this world and their meaning is to you know not be a as what we would conventionally say, a good person. You know, it's like a person who's gonna, you know, uh, look out for number one, make sure that he gets what he wants in this world. And even if it's at the detriment of others, but that's his meaning. That's what the meaning he chose for, for himself to be. And who are we to deny him that? Who are we to deny him, for example, if he wants to even hurt someone or even murder someone? Why does he not have that right? Because he's making his own meaning. That's what he believes in. So these are the questions that we have to ask ourselves and be skeptic about. And this book is an amazing, amazing, you know, piece of information and the food for thought uh, with regard to that particular, uh, those particular questions and problems. So that's what I really enjoy about this book. And that's what I really enjoy about Islamic philosophy in general. We have such a tight knit uh, philosophy uh, network that's, you know, all encompassing, that's comprehensive that's very, you know, uh, clear and direct. It's not something that's very vague and ambiguous and we don't know and we know a lot of things, but there's obviously some things we do not, as humans, we do not know. 
uh, as humans, we don't have all the information, but we do have the important information. That's what Islamic thought is about. And uh, yeah, that's something I'm going to hopefully be doing this summer, and I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, moving on to MMA. What do we have in MMA news today? Well, recently, you know, just yesterday, the UFC 262 press conference, uh, what, was it yesterday? No, no, it was uh, actually a few days ago, maybe like two or three days ago. Uh, the UFC 262 press conference, uh, you know, went on uh, with, you know, there being uh, Charles Oliveira, Michael Chandler, Tony Ferguson, and Benil Darius all on the table. And man, Tony went off uh, during the press conference. I made the whole thing a lot more fun. You know, you got Chandler, who is level-headed and very, uh, you know, a positive person, who is very into that, you know, self-actualization, make yourself the best version you can be. And you've got Charles Oliveira with all the skills that he has. And, you know, just, you know, being a boss, sitting there like a beast. And you've got Benil Daryusha, a really cool guy who's fighting his way into the top five and making a name for himself. And then you've got Tony Ferguson. And, oh, boy, it's good old Tony. He's just going off the whole time. <laughs> you know, he, he, you guys have to watch it. It's a great show. And, man, Tony was getting under uh, Benil's skin. And, uh, and Benil's like, what's up with you? Like, what are you doing? It's like, why are you making a fool out of yourself, essentially? And uh, Tony also went off on how he had a 12-fight win streak and didn't fight for the title, the real title, and uh, how Chandler has one fight in the UFC and now he's fighting for the title, and how he Chandler has that, as Tony would put it, that Dana White privilege. That was a funny thing that uh, you know Dana laughed at as well. Uh, but, you know, Tony did not come up with that. Um, Mexican Martial Arts, Grandmaster Jesse is the one who came out of that. Mexican, Mexican Martial Arts channel. Check it out. It's funny. It's great. Uh, he came up with that. But anyway, he was going off and talking about how there's injustices and there's racism. That's what's holding him back. It's funny funny that he brought brings racism up because Benil shut that down amazingly. Tony's like, you know, I'm Mexican and there's race, uh, racism here. And then Benil's like, bro, I've been... I'm born, uh, born and raised in Iran, and I'm here in America fighting, trying to make a name for myself, and I'm doing well. What racism are you talking about? <laughs> Basically, uh, Tony's saying because he's a Mexican-American, he's being racially profiled, and Benil, who's an Iranian who came to the U.S. and is, being, is successful, he's saying, what are you talking about? There is no racism. It's just that Tony lost his last two fights against top, com top uh, competition, you know, top contenders. Which is understandable. Of course, you could lose against top contenders such as, you know, uh, what's his name, uh, Justin Gaethje and Charles Oliveira. Obviously, that's not something to be ashamed about. You just lost, and that's why you're not in the title picture right now. And uh, this fight is important for you, Tony. If you pull this off against uh, Benil, it'd be awesome. You're back there. You're back in the mix. But if you don't, man, then I'm just. And Benil's a tough order. He's not easy. He's not gonna, he's amazing, he has power, he's amazing on the ground, he's a good scrambler. This guy has what it, uh, what it takes, honestly. But this fight against Tony is what, what he needs to really prove himself to see if he's a top five uh, contender. And uh, Tony, well, this fight with Benil is what's gonna determine whether or not he's still uh, in the mix of the top five. So, that's going on, and obviously you have the main event, Charles Oliveira versus Michael Chandler, and that's got to be awesome. It's such a 50-50 fight. They both have a lot going for them, and man, they both deserve to, you know, be in the top five. And uh, man, Chandler with his knockout power and wrestling background, and you've got Oliveira with his grappling skills, with his submission game, and 14 finishes submission, 14 finishes in the UFC, uh, 14 finishes in submission, 16 finishes overall in the UFC. This guy is a finishing machine and he's such a beast. He's so good at striking as well. He's so good at pushing the pace and covering distance. Man, it's going to be an amazing fight. What a 50 50 fight. It's like the fights with the, you know, previous fights for the lightweight title, let's say with Habib and Poirier or Habib and Connor, it was obviously on Habib's favor. Habib was the heavy favorite in those fights. But here, Habib's not here anymore, right? So. Since he's not here, they're gonna make a new a new lightweight champion who um, 
it's supposed to be you know Dustin Poirier because he's uh, he's done he has the best resume and he's only lost to Habib, but you know Dustin's fighting uh, Connor for the third time and uh, Chandler and Oliveira are gonna fight for the title and wait for the winner probably the winner of those uh, two fights, uh, though sorry those two in that fight of Poirier and Connor. It's the question was asked in the press conference to Dana whether the winner of Connor Poirier would fight the winner of the title fight. And obviously Dana said, obviously like he always says, we'll see how this this thing plays out. We'll see what happens. But it's it's ridiculous. The idea that Connor might get a title shot after beating Poirier, after losing his like two of his last three, it's just ridiculous how Connor's constantly being gifted title shots. But hey, you got Michael Chandler who's gifted a title shot one fight into the UFC. So anything could happen. It's what Dana wants, apparently. That's, you know, it's not what makes sense. It's what makes sense. It's what makes money. That's all. That's what Dana cares about at the end of the day. But hey, let's see what happens. In the words of the guy himself. Oh, and speaking of Tony, uh, he was getting under Benil's skin. He was going off and... I've actually read an excerpt from Habib's biography. You know, the biography he actually wrote before the Poirier fight. And uh, not his autobiography. Uh, I think it was his autobiography, but I don't know. It just said biography. Anyway, and how he mentions Tony and how he describes his interactions with Tony. Habib was genuinely, genuine. Habib genuinely disliked Tony. He didn't like him at all. Tony was too annoying for him. He was just... As Habib would say, he's a stupid guy. Good fighter, but he's a little bit stupid guy, as Habib said. So yeah, Tony's an amazing fighter, but as for his personality, look, I understand his, you know, his mental game, his hustle, his attitude, but why does he have to be so negative some some of the time? Not all the time, obviously, but a lot of the time. Why does he have to go off on opponents and whatnot? Like the his last fight with Charles Oliveira, he was cool. His past fight with Justin Gaethje, he was kind of cool as well. But now against Benil, he isn't, he isn't cool. And every time he met with Habib, it was just like, you know, tension. I don't know why he brings so much tension, but hey, it's Tony. And I honestly kind of wouldn't have him any other way. But at the same time, you know, the guy is himself, but not really. He puts on this, you know, persona of being brash. He is a brash person. He's such an intense, extreme person. His workouts are crazy, if you've heard of those. But why? Why do you bring so much tension into the place? But I guess it's understandable, because it is the fight game, and tension is what sells. There you go. Habib was... I just thank God. Alhamdulillah, Habib was just real the whole time, so we can see what a bona fide man. What a just... A manly man who's real and has no nonsense, no nonsense attitude, who's very kind, you know, humorous, and just really the epitome of manners, you know, at that level where you could say he's, you know, uh, at the epitome of manners that we, at least by today's standards, you know, uh, you don't see people like that much. I won't say you don't see him at, uh, see him at all, but you don't see him much. He's very unique in that. God bless him. Alhamdulillah, we had an example in Habib of how to conduct yourself. So, uh, I'm approaching the 30-minute mark uh, soon, guys. So, let's wrap it up. Final thoughts. I hope the fight is, the card is going to be awesome. I'm working, I spread out my work around the card so I can enjoy it with my friend. Uh, we're hopefully going to watch it and re hopefully going to enjoy it because last pay-per-view was just amazing. You know, as... You know, possibly one of the greatest cards of all time. Uh, just it was so good. So I regret missing. I low-key regret missing that one live. So I'm going to watch this one live, hopefully. And hopefully it's going to be a banger. It's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to watch it with a friend. I'm going to be there live in the morning. Oh, by the way, it starts at 6 a.m. Uh, like, the fights start around 6 a.m. for us in the morning. So we have to... <laughs> Kind of, uh, you know, we already wake up in the morning generally to pray, but we have to like stay awake now. And I've planned my day in order to for me to sleep early the uh, previous night in order to wake up early and enjoy the rest of the day 
uh, starting off with the card, obviously, with the uh, UFC fight card. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm really hoping this is going to be awesome. Just like last time, last card. So far, 2021 has had amazing moments in fights. From Max Holloway versus Calvin Cater to Poirier Connor to, you know, uh, what? Oh, for Ngannou Stipe and uh, Usman's fights. Just so many good car- uh, so many good fights. Too much, too many to mention. Anyway, guys, this was the Candle the Candle Life podcast by yours truly, Muhammad Abdullah. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope you come back for more. And once again, most men lead lives of silent desperation. See you guys in the next one. Peace.